I have to apologize to you. I wrote this between midnight last night and four this morning because I had come back from a speech at Eglin Air Force Base on terrorism in the Middle East and the plane didn't get in until midnight. But I had been writing this in various pieces and parts for the last close to a month. So I hope it's coherent. But what I'm going to talk to you about is the future of Army missile defense technology. And first I want to talk to you a little bit about the threat. Uh, I'm going to talk about these six bullets. One, preserving key capabilities. Uh, what are the missile threats in the relationship to geography? Uh, how that relates to what, I, what Masood, the former head of the Northern Alliance, calls the poisonous coalition arrayed against us. The terror affiliates and the terror states that use missiles. The Army's view of things. The Army Air and Missile Defense policy and role and their threat environment. What are the concerns of the Senate and House Armed Services Committees? And I'm probably going to talk primarily about Jay Lynn's but my brief is available on the website and you'll be able to read about the high directed energy, high energy laser mobile demonstrator from, uh, that you might find of interest. Let's start here. This is called balance in Washington, D.C. I had to give a slide that tells you that it is not a threat. As many of you know who Peter Bergen is, he said this two days ago, that you are more likely to die falling in your bathtub or being bitten by your dog than you are terrorism and uh, that we have an irrational fear of terrorism, as you know. So having gotten that out of the way, and now I can call this a balanced presentation, <laughs> let me start with the committee. This is a very important point, and it was made back in 1986 as well. And that was in seeing a drawdown in military spending, the committee said, please preserve key cap capabilities in times of fiscal austeri austerity. One of the things we preserved in 1986 was the research that led to something called the Joint Directed Air Munition, or JDAM. And as you know, in the Gulf War 91, JDAMs and directed energy, uh, the smart bombs were used by about 7% of all munitions. By the war in Afghanistan and the war in, Afghan in Iraq, as well as in the late 1990s in the Clinton administration, about 90% of everything we used were directed munitions similar to JDAM. And that's the point there. There's a new book out. It's called The Curse of Geography by my friend Robert Kaplan. And I don't agree with Bob on everything, but I think he's one of the most, one of the more brilliant folks around. I want you to read that first part. It's in a Wall Street Journal op-ed back in the 14th of October, in which he says, Countries that make up the heartland and rimland, which is basically Afghanistan writ large, are locked in a deathly geographical embrace of overlapping missile ranges. I think it's an extraordinary creative way of talking about what we are facing in the world. And I urge you, this is from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, an article about his book. I urge you to get his book and read it because as he said, back in 2006 in the Wall Street Journal in an article by Brett Stevens, who's the foreign policy writer on the op-ed page, the United States is behind the power curve when it comes to post-launch. Interesting way of talking about missile launches. And at that time, as you know, we were just in the process of deploying what are now over a thousand ballistic missile interceptors of all kinds. I mentioned Massoud, who's head of the Northern Alliance, who was murdered two days before 9-11. This is a, from the book Ghost Wars by Stephen Cole. It was serialized in the New Yorker magazine, and it's the one quote that is never quoted in the media since it came out in the book. If you do a Google search of this, it's very difficult to find. I think it is the single most important statement ever made in terms of, for us, understanding terrorism. And what he points out here is, and this was, as he said, he was talking about the fight in Afghanistan at the time, is that you're talking about a coalition of not only states and intelligence services and militaries, but as he writes, as you can see here, impoverished young students bust to their death as volunteer fighters from Pakistani religious schools, exiled Central Asian Islamic radicals, and so forth. If you remember, Benghazi was the source of more fighters in Iraq that came in through the Damascus airport to Iraq to kill Americans and fellow Muslims than any other place on the globe. And yet we heard, if you Google who was, the, who was fighting in Iraq, it was insurgents. 
They were all locally grown because they didn't like the presence of the crusader, meaning the United States. They were coming from all over the world. They were coming from Iran primarily, and they were coming from Libya through Syria, where as the Iraqi government said over and over again, would write to the Syrian government and said, would you shut down the rat lines that are coming into our country? And our government would say, well, that's between you two governments. You take care of it. It was the surge in Iraq that was the response to the fact these rat lines were sending thousands and thousands of jihadis into Iraq. That is what we're facing. I also want to point out that there are other countries that are not Islamic that are part of this coalition. Back in 2009, Robert Morgenthau, who is now 96, I believe, and retired as the attorney for the city of New York, in April 2009 and September 2009, indicted two Chinese companies for helping Iran with ballistic missile technology transfers, and this is what's key. He did not say nuclear energy. The indictment says nuclear weapons technology. And if you go Google just in the last month, headlines in all the major mass media, 90% of them will say that Iran is not seeking a nuclear weapon. Then why do we indict him for, why do we indict two Chinese companies for supplying the very technology that you use to build nuclear triggers for a nuclear bomb? And I took 2009 because he was interviewed at the same time by Larry Kudlow in a fascinating interview about the access of what he called both Venezuela, Iran, and China, and how they're working together. And I urge you to go and look up his look on the website there. So this is something I wrote for a class that I teach at the Intelligence University as a guest lecture on nuclear terrorism. And it's the bottom underlined sentence which is the most important. Why is terrorism used today? It allows states not to have anything attributed to them. And missiles happen to be one of the primary means, whether it's Hamas or Hezbollah or the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, as you've seen through all of North Africa and the Middle East. Missiles, as Uzi Rubin has pointed out, are the coin of the realm when it comes to these countries. Bob Kaplan says the same thing. He says if you take every country from North Korea across the rim through India, Pakistan, all through the Middle East and North Africa, the one commonality in the defense establishments of these countries is the deployment and purchase and production of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, short and long range, and that is a commonality of these folks. Now, for those of you who want a, my friend Paul Ramirez is one of my dearest friends and writes the editorial page for the Investor's Business Daily, as well as being a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. We often hear about the Akhani network or Taliban or Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. And we're told they're in the Northwest Territories in the unruled areas. They get all their help and all their sanctuary and all their weapons and all their money apart from the heroin crop from the ISI. And this is the point of this cartoon. And yet we rarely hear that Pakistan is a state sponsor of terror and basically sending al Qaeda and al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters across the board, border to kill fellow Afghanis, Pashtu tribesmen, and of course coalition soldiers including Americans. So with that background, this was put up here by, I think, Uzi Rubin in one of his breakfast speeches that he gave. This is from 1990, and it's from the Air Armament Center, and this is the ballistic missile proliferation as of 1990. This is 2009, used by the director of MDA, and if you did one today, it would be twice the number of boxes and lines, and if you want to go look at it in detail, it's pretty extraordinary. If you trace where all these rockets come from, they all come from states, governments, particularly Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. These rockets are going all over the world, and they are the proliferation we face. Now what's the Army's view of these? They make a kind of interesting point. They say this is an era of persistent conflict that the proliferation of threat technology is primarily missiles. There's a rapid change in the arsenals. There's varied threats. They are aimed at population areas and areas as well as fixed military assets. 
They require the Army to be very maneuverable and have wide area security as opposed to just point defense. And one of the most interesting things in the Army's document that recently just came out within the last week on Army and missile defense was they support NORTHCOM to detect, deter, and prevent attacks against CONUS, the continental United States, which gets into the issue of who s protects us, the Coast Guard, the Navy, the Army, Homeland Security, the FBI, police, first responders, which we haven't made a very clear demarcation, and it's one of the areas which I'll get into about some of the <laughs> threats where I see some emerging technologies being very helpful. The Army also says that global threats from empowered non-state actors, it's a quote, I would turn it around, that terror groups empower terror master states. Terror masters, of course, is that wonderful phrase used by Mike Ledeen to describe Iran and Syria and others, which I think is excellent, is that my view is terror groups are used by states to augment the state's power to be able to attack us surreptitiously without attribution, which if you can't have attribution, it makes deterrence very difficult. And even in the case of Hamas and Hezbollah with rockets raining down on Israel, and have any of you been to Israel and been in Sederat or Ashkelon and seen, when I was there last, I remember in the village, we, the police chief showed me a shed. The, the wall is about the length of this wall, and it's about 20 feet high, and it's filled with nothing but rockets that have come out of Gaza. Now, they've all been blown up, or so, but they're all very, and you can see them made in all different sizes and shapes, all different technologies and talent. Some of them look like they've been made out of your backyard. Some of them look like they've been made more sophisticated in places like China and, in, and Iran. But what was interesting, while we were there visiting, the rockets started coming in from Hamas, from Gaza. And the schoolyard, for example, which is a f popular target of Hamas, the children no longer go to school there. The school is empty. The children go to school in private homes which are much less able to be targeted, which tells you the kind of, so we're dealing with not only terrorism and coercion and blackmail, but criminality and regular and irregular warfare, says the Army. And these asymmetrical threats include ballistic and cruise missiles, unmanned drones. As you notice that Hezbollah launched a couple drones over Israel, primarily to see, I think, what the Israelis would do, and they shot it down. But I think that was part of what you've seen, and uh, whether the drone came from Iran or Syria, we're not sure yet. And what's interesting, in the Ara Operation Iraqi Freedom, we used 41 or 50 Patriot batteries. We deployed them in seven countries. And today, we have seven of our 15 Patriot batteries and three of our three Tippy-2 radars that are deployed. And the Army then concludes that, in their view, there are three key areas in which this threat is very, very serious. The, North Korean, the Korean Peninsula in North Korea, the Persian Gulf, and what surprised me was maritime. I said the maritime areas, particularly those where American forces are, but also continental United States. And then, then said a number of things they're trying to look for in the future. They need systems that have very fast decision time. They want to not have just a single point of failure. I mean, if the bad guys take out one element, we can't see, nor sense, nor be able to shoot at the bad stuff coming in. It needs to be joint and integrated with systems already in existence and must deal with the full range of air and missile threats. Now, what about Congress? I went through the House and Senate Armed Services Committees and the Hack and Sack reports, and this is what they suggested we need to do. Buy more Tippy-2 radars, see if we can share the kill vehicles between Aegis and ground-based mid-course, deploy an East Coast defense, and they said it could be standard missile 1A or 1B. It could be two or three stage GBIs, and the cost, they estimated it between 1.2 and 3.6 billion. They also said the GBI should be enhanced, sustained, and enhanced, and upgraded, what they called well hedged. They said that there's a highly inadequate testing pace of everything. They said the two most important things that they want are discrimination kill assessment, and they said, given the pivot to Asia, they're particularly interested in the standard missile and its applicability to the Pacific. They also mentioned Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow, both issues of co-production as well as make an emphasis that the systems in Israel 
defend against specific threats from a particular geographic area that is known as opposed to what the Army is looking at is 360 areas where they have to protect the threat from all over. And the other thing they said is that in terms of Patriot, which is the vast majority of our thousand plus interceptors that we have deployed, that they're looking at how to long term modernization that through 2035, emphasizing insertion of technology, and they called harvesting technology improvements. I think one of the things I find fascinating is if you look at people's assumptions about, and we saw that in the debate between the Vice President and Congressman Ryan, that not only do the Iranians supposedly not have anything they can put fissile material in, but they have no delivery vehicle because they don't have an ICBM. If you remember the re threat reports from the CIA to the President in 1997, which became the basis of the famous August 2001 threat assessment, is that Al Qaeda was interested in hijacking airplanes. And the assumption was they were going to hijack airplanes overseas and use them as bait or ransom to get back prisoners, which they have done historically. The PLO uh, invented that. And that was true. That's what they have always done until they did what? They didn't do it again. They flew it into buildings. And so my view is, interestingly, it took America how long to figure out that airplanes can become missiles? A matter of minutes that morning for the folks in Pennsylvania took down that airplane because they understood they weren't hijacking the airplane in order to have a prisoner swap anymore. Just as it is with missiles, I'm always fascinated by people who assume that there's always a return address and therefore deterrence works. Yes, until rockets are launched from the ocean or from crowded urban settings. It's interesting, we know where the rockets come from Gaza. We know they come from Hezbollah and Lebanon, but does that deter them from launching them? No. And if they come out from the ocean, which is my worry about Iran, then the question is, when it does happen, will we know where it comes from? Yes, the ocean. Will we know the freighter? Maybe. It could be sunk. Jihadis will get 72 mermaids. And so the question is, the deterrence connection in terms of attribution breaks down. What I'm going to talk about is, this is from a piece that I wrote October 17th that is on uh, Family Security Matters. There's a system called JLENS. It's uh, a joint land attack cruise missile defense elevated netter, netted sensor system. I hope I, I don't want to be the major who figured out how to uh, name that one. But it's done two tests, September, April 25th and September 21st. It demonstrated its ability to work with both Navy and Army systems, the Patriot Standard Missile 6. And also this morning on the table is a piece that came out at midnight tonight uh, from Human Events on JLENS, which I urge you to read, as well as Chet Nagel's piece that he wrote for the Committee on the Present Danger. This is from Chet's original piece and some very interesting things. JLENS is a dirigible, if you want to call it that. We did have a high altitude airship, but it was too heavy and so that's no longer it's in some low, very low level R&D, but it's fascinating. He said that 532 commercial ships were sunk off the U.S. coast in World War II, had no air escort. But of 89,000 ships that had airship cover, only one, only one ship was lost. And he also pointed out that the Straits of Gibraltar were closed to Axis submarines from June 1944 to the end of the war. Why? Because we had one airship. One airship. So the question is, you could have two aerostats, is what they're called. You could deploy them over the Persian Gulf. You could deploy two over the Korean, one over the Korean Peninsula. They have a 500, 550 kilometer circle coverage. They can detect missiles, aircraft, ships. They also can detect swarming ships, which is one of the problems we're facing in the Persian Gulf. And their fire control radar is integrated with a whole host of systems both Army and Air Force, as well as Navy. And what's interesting, they can see over the horizon, which is, I think, critical. They track low-flying cruise missiles 24-7, 360 degrees. Uh, they're tethered to a fuel supply, so the weight of the, the 
weight of the J lens is very little compared to like an airship. One of the points is made is that gives the U.S. and ROC com combat commanders to engage threats such as road mobile short range ballist, uh, missile launchers was a point made by the Army why they would like this. It could protect the Straits of Hormuz and what's interesting is last yesterday the head of PACCOM who spoke at the conference down at Eglin Air Force Base said the area that he wants to protect from ballistic missiles is not just the Straits of Hormuz but the Malacca Straits. Far more freight and oil and traffic goes through the Straits of Malacca and if you've ever seen it you have to go north towards Singapore and then down through this area of over 600 kilometers and then back up through Java and then into the Pacific. That area is now becoming a hotbed of what off the coast of Somalia we saw six years ago which is piracy. 90 percent of which is commercial and if you don't think so then it's fascinating these pirates have law firms that they have contracted with in England primarily which will call up the ship owners and say this is what the ransom, ransom is you can wire it to this bank account which is done on a regular basis I think 10 percent of the piracy is political uh, one friend of mine at the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff office said that you have to understand the pirates of Somalia are not pirates they're not sailors they're Bedou they're tribesmen and they see tankers as nothing more than lost camels at sea so it makes a lot of sense given the tradition of grabbing these things because they're not owned by anybody except for whoever owns that portion of the desert. Interesting, the largest crude carrier, it's an interesting story in the world, the SS Sirius Star, was captured in October of 2008 by the pirates. And an enterprising reporter asked the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mr. Mullins, uh, Admiral Mullins, how could they know it was 460 kilometers off the coast of Somalia? They don't have GPS, do they? And he said there are only two countries that could give them that information. One is the United States and one is Russia, and we didn't give it to them. There was no follow-up to that question. I wrote a piece for Gatestone, uh, which used to be part of Hudson, on this subject of, it was interesting, is that shortly thereafter, the meeting that had been held between the head of OPEC and Mr. Putin, where OPEC refused to reduce its production of oil in order to jack the price up. Two weeks after that, the, US, the SS Sirius Star was captured. And then in the five successive meetings of OPEC that followed that until April of 2009, the oil price went from $28 a barrel to $102 a barrel. Of course, there's no connection. Uh, next slide. One of the things I found interesting in reading some of the literature is you know what the Club K cruise missile system is. That's a freighter that looks like a b bunch of boxes like you see in all the ports of the world sold by the Russians. And these boxes aren't filled with anything. They're empty. They open up and an erector pops up and a cruise missile shoots out of it. And you can buy them for about a couple million bucks. And the Russians say they have no intention of selling this to any bad guys. The only question is, if they sell it to somebody, will they sell it to the bad guys? And one of the things I find is that J-Lens could really be an amazing capability against a missile launched 300 or 500 kilometers off our coast in an EMP mode. And I want to tell a story that occurred back in 1999. Twelve members of the House Armed Services Committee, six Democrats, six Republicans, met the Russians in Geneva. And uh, we're talking about Kosovo. And the Russians were not happy about what was going on, as many of you know. And a Russian, uh, senior Russian leader at the meeting had said nothing over the entire day of meetings. And Kurt Weldon, who knows Russian fluently and is a Russian studies major, asked the individual, would he like to say something? And he said, yes, you've treated us terribly since the end of the Cold War. We live in tents. We have no money. We're trading vodka and potatoes for food. He says, just remember, we can launch a submarine-launched ballistic missile off your coast. You will not know what happened. And we can explode a warhead 70 to 100 miles above your country and explode it and have an EMP attack and kill tens of millions of you people, and you won't know what happened. Now, he spoke that in Russian, and Kurt then translated for the other 11 members of the House and Armed Services Committee, at which point they mostly turned white. But as Congressman Bartlett, who was one of the participants in the meeting, said, 
Right after they got that bad news, the individual's deputy, who was right out of central casting and James Bond and Smirsh Inspector, said, and if that one doesn't work, we have plenty of spares. Interesting, the House in two years ago passed what's called the Grid Protection Act. Yvette Clark, Congresswoman from Brooklyn, Trent Franks, Congressman from Arizona, Roscoe Bartlett from Maryland, and Benny Thompson from Mississippi, two Democrats, two Republicans, unanimously got this bill passed. It has not since passed, even been brought up in the Senate, but it was to protect our grid against EMP, but you could also do it with respect to Jalen's because it would give you that wide area view of the ocean and protect us. And given time, I'm going to go to the end. I think it's key that the Army sees these emerging threats very similar to what's going on with respect to Iran. Iran, as you know, has tested an EMP mode rocket, launched off the Caspian, off a barge, and they also did it in the Indian Ocean, and they exploded it 70 miles above the Earth's surface. And our intelligence community said, well, that must have been a failure. The Air Force said no. When they testified or gave the information to the Rumsfeld Commission, they said, no, it wasn't a failure. This was an EMP mode test. And so that, I put, you put two and two together, and you ask yourself, the other thing is, I know in the number of German magazines and newspapers and others have said that, and Mr. Uh, Morgenthau said the Iranians are helping build ballistic missile bases, doing some of the initial work in Venezuela. And it just so happens that the Shahab 3, if launched from Venezuela, can land in what American city? Miami. Exactly. 2,000 kilometers. And so when I look at the major key requirements of what the Army says we need in the Persian Gulf, the Korean Peninsula, and maritime protection, JLENS fits the bill exactly. And it is ready to go. They need to do a test, a real world test that they've done in this country with the Navy and the Army elements, but they want to do one in CENTCOM and do it over the Persian Gulf in real and they have $40 million to do that. And unfortunately, they didn't ask for Army uh, country clearance. So when the OSD said, you want to do the test, but did you get permission from the country, we're going to do the test over? And they kind of looked like, what are you talking about? And so that wasn't done. So they have to go back and get the money reprogrammed. It's been taken away and they're going to get it. So if we do that test, this is a system that is ready to go and my 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 plea is, for those of you who take a look at this, is that even in an era of downsizing and reduction in our budgets, this is a technology that 10 years from now when it's deployed, I hope, we will look back and say thanks. I'm really glad we sustained it and maintained it and produced it. Thank you all. Thanks again for the opportunity to uh, come and speak with you and, and have a discussion uh, with you. Um, it's clear that, uh, that the Army is at a strategic inflection point. Uh, I think that there's little doubt about that. It's coming out of a decade plus of war, and uh, there is a new defense strategy that's, uh, that's on the street. So the Army finds itself with one leg in the current fight. It knows it has uh, another essentially two years of fighting in Afghanistan and transitioning uh, that, uh, that effort to uh, the Afghan uh, National Army. Uh, and it has its other uh, leg in uh, where it's going, in a, in a transition, if, if you will. And that, uh, the foundation for that transition really is uh, the, the new defense strategy. Uh, so we in Raytheon are uh, closely monitoring and studying uh, the Army, uh, what it's saying, what it's writing in its concepts, what it's writing in its doctrine, et cetera, because we're most interested in this, this transition. And this transition at this point in time is, is, uh, is not absolutely clear, but the, the Army is preparing the intellectual foundation 
for this uh, shift into into this uh, new area, new era. And uh, of course, we are uh, very, very interested in this. We have in Raytheon spent the last decade plus in supporting uh, our Army uh, and the special operations community in uh, the fights in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but we know as the Army transitions that we want to try to transition with it, get out ahead of it, uh, make sure that we're making the right investments that are going to give them the capabilities uh, for uh, the future. So we are studying things like the Army's capstone uh, concept uh, where they've introduced the idea of uh, operational adaptability uh, based on the uncertainty and the complexity of the future environment uh, out there. and it. It, it knows that it's going to have to open its aperture uh, from one of, of clear razor focus on uh, counterinsurgency to the 11 missions that it's been given in the new defense strategy. So it's an uh, opening of this aperture that has given rise to this concept of, that the Army calls operational uh, adaptability. Uh, they have also, in conjunction with the United States Marines, uh, written a companion concept to air-sea battle uh, that's called uh, Gaining and Maintaining Access. And uh, if you haven't read it, I would, I would encourage you to read this because uh, oftentimes the, the Army is kind of in charge of where, where are you at in this whole uh, concept of air-sea battle. And it has done a lot of thinking about this and its role. And when you read this, it really harkens back to the days of what I would just call uh, forced entry, uh, establishment of lodgements, uh, reception station, on removement and integration, those types of things that the Army had been prepared to do in, in, the, uh, in the past. But uh, servicing uh, certain uh, penetration points in the area denial portion of uh, anti-access and uh, aerial denial concepts. Uh, so we're, we're studying that, uh, that very closely and certainly the Army 2020 uh, vision and the initiatives that the Chief of Staff of the Army is looking at, you know, which includes uh, a, a number of things. I won't go into all the details there, but I will mention a few and one of that is the regional alignment of uh, forces. Uh, as you know, there are certain forces that are assigned to the combatant commands out there, but beyond that, the Army wants to begin aligning its forces uh, with, with the combatant commands. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for the Army here uh, in another dimension, and that is uh, the dimension of defense exportability. Uh, because defense exportability is advantageous to the Army from a couple of uh, standpoints. Uh, the first standpoint is affordability. Uh, if you export it, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, you gain economies of scale. Uh, and secondly, uh, you can have other countries pay for non-recurring engineering costs, et cetera. So in this era of declining resources, I think there is a leverage point there for the Army. Secondly, uh, it gives you interoperability with your partner nations out there. Uh, and so there is a way uh, in, in this whole idea of regional alignment for the Army to uh, leverage defense exportability. Uh, there is also much discussion of integration of conventional and soft forces. I will tell you that the Army has learned much from the special operations community in these two wars, and I'll talk just a little bit uh, more about that. And the third point that I'll mention down there, there is a, there is a, a focus now in the United States Army in maturing its uh, cyber capabilities, and more about that just a little bit later. Uh, the other thing that we're watching closely, of course, is uh, the budget and the impacts of the budget uh, on uh, the force structure of the Army. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an area of uh, strategic uh, concern. Uh, as it stands now, based on the decisions, the plans, et cetera, the Army is going to lose mass. Uh, it's going to uh, reduce its size by 80,000 down to 490,000. Uh, and uh, it, the number of units, its force structure, are, is going to go down. Uh, and there, there are strategic consequences of that because mass has its own quality. Uh, but I would tell you the other thing uh, that I think is uh, important about this is uh, there is a historical trend 
in, uh, in ground maneuver, and that is a concept that uh, Patty Griffin called uh, the, the, um, uh, the emptying of the battle space. Uh, and, and what we mean by that is smaller units operating in much larger operational areas. I'll just give you an idea about this. You know, uh, if uh, many of you have been up on the, uh, the battlefield up in Gettysburg, uh, well, that is where two armies fought one another up there. Up, you know, that operational area is, is probably a good size now for a battalion task force in the United States Army. Uh, and when you look at Afghanistan, you have very small units, companies, platoons, squads operating from uh, forward operating bases that, uh, that are very geographically dispersed out there. Uh, and so <clears throat> what, th what this means is there's a greater emphasis on the smaller units out there. And the armies recognize this, and they've, they've talked about the squad being the foundation of the strategic force. So there's much thinking about how do you better enable smaller units? Because down at the smaller unit level, it's pretty much of a fair fight. You know, it's machine guns and rifles against machine guns and rifles. Uh, and so how do you create overmatch at those uh, smaller levels uh, down there? And, and again, I think the Army's learned much from the special operations uh, community uh, because they have, I think, developed very, very good concepts in creating overmatch at their very small units that are conducting their raids, their direct action missions out there. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how, they, how they've done that. Uh, so what are those capability areas, I think, for the future? As the Army makes this transition and this shift, I think, uh, that are going to be very, very important for the Army out there. I think, uh, <clears throat> number one, uh, the network. Uh, and the Army, I think, has got this about right in, in terms of its number one modernization priority. Um, why is that? Uh, it goes back to this emptying of the battle space and smaller units over larger geographical areas and, and tying those units together and connecting them with the capabilities that they need, not only in terms of, of, of greater situational understanding out there, but also in terms of tying those units into capabilities like joint fires, uh, into aviation assets, uh, into logistics, those types of things that will provide them the overmatch that they need. And, that, and this is one of the things that they've learned from the, from the soft community. When those units leave the FOBs uh, at night to go out there and conduct those direct uh, action missions out there, uh, from the standpoint of mission planning, to traveling to the objective, actions on the objective, returning uh, back to the FOB, they are completely in an overmatched situation out there. And what enables that is the connectivity to the ha they have to all of those capabilities. So this is a lesson that the Army uh, is, has learned and, and why the network uh, is, is very, very important. Uh, the second area, I think, uh, continues to be the importance of ISR, intelligence, surveillance, uh, and reconnaissance, and what's important there, and it's going to be important in a very complex environment where the human domain is increasingly important out there, is the business of discrimination, being able to identify who is friend, who is foe, uh, and being able to give you the target location accuracy that enables you to deal with that uh, that particular threat out there. And then the analytical tools uh, from the sensors uh, that you have that gives you the dis discrimination, but the analytical tools uh, that they will need uh, to be able then to understand the situations uh, and then prosecute uh, their operations. Uh, certainly on the ground, one of the areas I think that the Army will, will take great interest in is, is this business of third gen FLIR technology. Uh, and, and being able to see at longer ranges with greater clarity in uh, both the uh, short wave and long wave uh, IR spectrums, I think, is, is going to be very, very important for the Army as it, as it moves into the future. Uh, the third area certainly uh, is the area of aviation. Uh, the, the aviation has proved itself uh, in these last two wars. It will be very, very important, particularly if you're talking about this business of maintaining and gaining ac or gaining and maintaining access uh, in uh, in the Pacific out there, uh, you have to go over the water or through the air, 
uh, to make the penetrations, et cetera. Aviation is going to be absolutely important uh, to doing that. It's notable that the Army, as it begins reducing its brigade combat teams, are holding uh, their aviation brigades constant out there. So you're not going to see a lot of reduction in the uh, force structure of, of aviation. And you have to think about aviation beyond the platforms. You have to think about the payloads on aviation, whether they're manned or unmanned. And we've seen in this current fight uh, the, the, uh, the importance of uh, UAVs, uh, the unmanned uh, side of aviation out there, the sensors that they carry, the downlinks that they have, and the lethal effectors that they have on, on, those, uh, on those platforms. So I think that you're going to, you know, this is going to be a, an area, a capability area the Army is going to continue to develop out there uh, in all of those areas, uh, sensing uh, the comms links and the lethal effectors. Uh, I think the fourth area, and my, uh, my colleague Peter pointed this out, uh, is in the area of, of protection and the concern about the proliferation of threats of, of UAVs, ballistic missiles, uh, cruise missiles, et cetera. It is a fact. They are proliferating out there. And what the Army has to do is protect itself. Now, it certainly in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's been a focus on counter-rockets and mortars against the FOBs out there, and the Army has begun uh, several programs to deal with that particular threat. But we know with what the Israelis have faced, um, uh, specifically uh, those capabilities that have been brought to bear by Hezbollah, um, uh, are, uh, are significant uh, out there. And so all of these uh, types of capabilities in terms of sensing, and Peter talked about uh, JLENS, a very important sensing capability out there. Uh, but, it, but if you think about insertion of forces in the Pacific, uh, in island chains, et cetera, uh, against a very uh, able threat, you have to be able to protect those forces out there. So making sure that there, is, there are capabilities that exist to protect against UAVs, ballistic mis missiles, uh, cruise missiles, uh, I think are going to, be, uh, going to be very, very important. Along those same lines, the IED threat is not going to go away. Uh, I think that the Army and the Department of Defense will continue its efforts in developing technologies that can enable uh, helping to protect and defeat uh, the chain uh, out there on the uh, IED front. Uh, the fifth area that, uh, that I would note I think that the Army is going to be placing emphasis on is in the cyber area. Uh, certainly, uh, they have dealt with uh, the insider threats that have been brought about by WikiLeaks, uh, et cetera. Uh, but uh, as, as the network grows and the network grows in importance to the Army, protecting that network becomes very, very important out there. And the Army has begun to, um, uh, you know, develop its and mature its capabilities out there. And Raytheon has been uh, fortunate and we've been able to uh, assist the Army based on the capabilities that we have developed uh, to protect our own networks. Um, and I think uh, uh, probably uh, one of the other areas uh, that I would, uh, would, would like to mention out here, uh, again, gets back to uh, this business of um, the overmatch of the, of the small unit down there. Um, we have watched very carefully over the last uh, year as, as, as when Marty Dempsey became the Chief of Staff of the Army and later uh, replaced by Ray Odierno, this idea of how do you, how you create overmatch at the, at the uh, squad and platoon level, the smaller units down there. Um, in our opinion, this all has to do with connectivity. How, how do you connect it to the v greater capabilities out there? Those capabilities that used to be controlled by division commanders and brigade commanders, et cetera, how do you move that control down to smaller units? Uh, how do you train uh, your leaders and, and the units at that level to be able to integrate uh, those types of capabilities out there? This is a big issue for the Army. Uh, it could be a very costly issue, uh, but that is the historical trend. Uh, because if you look at, uh, at things over time, the mass of the Army is going down. And 490,000 
uh, is, is a small number. And just remember, uh, when we got into these wars, the Army had to grow itself, the Marines had to grow themselves as quickly as they can, uh, but, it, but it's very difficult to grow an Army quickly under a kind of an all-volunteer uh, concept out there. Um, so this business of mass is, is going to be an issue uh, that the Army's going to have to deal with it. Uh, there's, there's a couple of ways you can deal with it. You can, you can make a larger army, which uh, probably becomes uh, unaffordable, uh, or you can find ways of, of, of moving capabilities to much smaller packages, uh, much smaller units down there, et cetera. So I look forward to uh, the questions that you might have during the period. So thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'll be uh, presenting a type of view of, uh, of, uh, of the potential future battle space, types of threats that we'll be looking at in the future from a couple of standpoints. Uh, one standpoint is from the uh, standpoint of S&T intelligence, science and technology intelligence, which specializes in looking and seeing what other people are doing uh, uh, how they how, how different organizations, different uh, societies absorb, use, and then militarize te technology in unique ways, and uh, as well as the issue of proliferation of, of certain baseline technologies. And then the other standpoint is, is what we need to do in order to maintain the flexibility in our future army that will ensure from, uh, from the basic R&D level that whatever threat we face in the future, which will undoubtedly be unpredictable from today's vantage point, uh, that the basic tools and flexibilities to meet those threats will be there because the baseline technology has kept pace with, uh, uh, with the state of, uh, of technological development in general. So uh, these are important things to think about. Uh, Preserving existing capabilities is important, but it's not good enough. Because with future wars will, will uh, in, you know, in 10 or 20 years from now, will not be, will be fought partially with today's technologies, but the innovation that will be required to handle uh, ever increasing lethal environments for our forces have to be addressed by the introduction of new technology, new capabilities, uh, bolstered by existing capabilities. Uh, we never throw anything away, thank God. Uh, things that we use in, this, in the Spanish-American War are still somewhere in the U.S. Army's inventory and, and, come, in, and come in handy, you know, uh, in, in unique situations. That's important to maintain, but new stuff has to come online as well. Adversaries are not static. They're very creative. Uh, in many cases, they're every bit as smart as we are. Uh, and they have a unique approach to problem solving, one where you can have two cultures pick up the same tool called a hammer and use it for two entirely different things that neither one conceives of uh, on their own, but they have unique ways of solving problems. Some of the things that we're looking at just in, in general, uh, any, anybody can look at, is the, uh, is the proliferation of uh, biological capabilities around the world. The ability to manipulate the human genome, the ability to very, very rapidly create new artificial agents that can be weaponized very, very quickly. The growth of uh, synthetic biology and the dropping of the price of the tools for genetic manipulation uh, are, are factors that we need to come to grips with because they're very real. They lower the bar and barrier to entry into this type of field uh, very, very quickly, both by state actors and by non-state actors. Uh, we have do-it-yourself biology as a culture that has uh, a subculture that has been growing very rapidly here in the United States and Europe and Africa and Asia and other places. And do-it-yourself biology is a, it sometimes takes the form of uh, time-sharing laboratories where in Brooklyn, New York, for instance, uh, Brooklyn where I came from, it's a different Brooklyn today, uh, you have now time-sharing labs where you have uh, 
we have very, very advanced um, uh, biological manipulation equipment and laboratories that virtually anybody can buy time on, like you used to buy time on, net, on computer networks. Now you can go in and do experiments with minimal supervision and actually engage in production activities, on small scale production. So if you can't afford the technology yourself, you can find a group and association to do it with. There are user group type concepts on, on the internet that where you have PhDs in micro and molecular biology who are advising neophytes in this area how to conduct experiments, how to actually achieve goals using, uh, using new processes, new techniques, new machinery which is now affordable, small size, and you can fit in your closet. You can have a, a, a biology lab in your closet uh, these days. What this means is when you combine it with uh, the proliferation of uh, biological safety laboratory level four facilities around the world and level three facilities around the world, which are growing like wildfire in countries where who now have multiple BSL-4 facilities that there's no apparent need for, uh, like places like Indonesia, which now has multiple BSL-4s. Now, BSL-4 labs are laboratories that are, that are uh, certified as capable of handling the most infectious, the most virulent, and the most fatal uh, diseases, like the hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola, Marburg, um, and other types of hemorrhagic fevers, uh, Congo-Crimean hemorrhagic fever, et cetera. And these labs are, are popping up all over the world, despite the fact that the diseases aren't at popping up all over the world. So what you're basically ha seeing is a standby capacity to engage in very, very advanced bio-war if people choose to, and who they let into the labs and where those people go afterwards is a serious concern. It's not all, the threat is not completely anymore. The Russian uh, disaffected bioscientist who is now, who walks off the reservation and goes to third country and sells his, uh, his skills to the highest bidder. Now you have people from all over the world getting PhDs in these subjects and along with the capability in third countries of actually engaging in, in activities which, uh, which could be a threat. Now one of the things that we need to do other than simply recognize this threat is to try to curtail it in some fashion to prevent and preempt uh, future use of uh, dangerous biological elements, agents. But we also need to do things to harden the soldier to increase his immunity to non-indigenous things that are going to be happening in areas or indigenous diseases that will be amplified and weaponized when our soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen go to uh, austere locations or places they don't traditionally go to. Because the biological threat is going to get, owning it and grow and get more serious. So uh, not increasing, doing programs to increase the research in nonspecific immunity to harden people against a range of diseases. And in this, of course, this can ripple into the general population as well as a, uh, as a, as a health care uh, uh, benefit in the long run. So the biological area is very of concern. There's a lot of opportunities in bio biologics as well. Uh, the use of the growth of, uh, of petroleum-eating bacteria, which we've seen dumped in vast numbers in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in part as part of the cleanup for the uh, for the BP uh, disaster that occurred, uh, has many other uh, offensive and defensive uh, uh, you know hallmarks as well, such as antimaterial agents which can degrade uh, propellants, degrade POL fuel supplies, and other things without ever firing a shot. But these things are also being developed elsewhere, and they can be used against us. So for the future, these novel types of warfare, kind of unorthodox by today's standards, are being enabled today and will continue to be enabled today and will be a threat in the future as well as an opportunity in the future. They're all double-edged swords. They can, have, uh, we can, they can be effectively used by us or against us. Uh, some of the other areas that we need to really look at very, very carefully for the future or how do, how do our forces with all the brilliant weapons and smart weapons and GPS guided devices, how do they operate in an area where GPS is denied? You know, the Chinese have been on a massive campaign of building Loran stations, coastal navigation stations. The United States was on a massive campaign for the last decade and a half of tearing down our Loran stations, 
to become, so we became so reliant upon GPS for everything. And we saw Loran as being an obsolescent technology. Well, it is obsolescent if you live in a perfect world and your adversary doesn't have the capability of jamming, disabling, or shooting down your GPS systems. We're entering an era now where that capability is growing very quickly, the ability to disrupt, selectively deny, or totally eliminate in, in, in large areas of the world uh, the ability to navigate by global positioning system and satellite coverage. Now, if your adversary is building an alternative system like LORAN, all around the periphery of the South Pacific and the South China Sea and, and the East China Sea. And they're looking at and, and basically providing themselves an alternative to GPS. And it seems very logical that in a future conflict or a heightened era t a time of hostilities that GPS might be eliminated or, or masked or blocked in some fashion, thereby disabling some of our primary premier uh, capabilities for navigation and guidance and fire control. So that issue of how to operate in a GPS-denied or nav-denied uh, environment that we're so dependent on now, that we, we, have, we are so proud of now, uh, has to be addressed as well for redundant capable uh, operations. Uh, the, one of the baseline technologies that we need to keep investing in through the, in, through the infusion of money into basic R&D at the 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3 levels of funding are, is for power sources, portable power sources, disposable power sources of all types, from the very smallest uh, type of power sources to power uh, micro sensors up through the ability to power a, uh, a Navy ship with ultra capacitors with very, very quick discharge to power rail guns. Uh, that's an area that is probably the single greatest enabler in the future. The ability to conquer the power problem will enable technologies and capabilities that we don't even dream of right now, because that's the big barrier to entry for most uh, really future-oriented, uh, highly capable. Get rid of your plates if you want to get rid of them. That'll be easy. Can your podcasters okay? That's mine. Right there. Okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're prepared now for our uh, lunch and keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Singer from the Brookings Institution. I'm going to try just a little bit of a different introduction for Peter. It's not going to be a long one, but in his latest book, Wired for War, he had some of the greatest quotes that introduced chapters and different uh, reasons that he got into this that I've ever seen of any, any book I've read, any forward. But I thought I would uh, just quickly read literally the first paragraph of his book. Uh, and he starts out and he, he says, um, I was a bit of an odd kid. 
All kids develop hobbies and fixations, be it baseball cards, Barbie dolls. Indeed, I haven't met a six-year-old boy yet who doesn't know everything there is to know about dinosaurs. But for me, growing up, it was war. I could be more polite and say military history, but it really was just war. In saying the same about his childhood, the great historian John Kagan wrote, it's not a phrase to be written, it's still less spoken with any complacency, but is true nonetheless. And so over Peter's amazing career to date, he's been a, a consultant at the, the Pentagon, he's worked at the Pentagon, he's been a consultant to Congress, a consultant to the CIA, a consultant to the State Department. He's the director of the 21st Century <coughs> Defense Initiative at the Brookings Institution. He's a, 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 an amazing author, prolific. You read, at, you look at any of the blogs, Peter's writing an article about every other day. But he's really, really come to the fore in his discussions about technology and robotics. And I just couldn't uh, be more thrilled to have a speaker like um, uh, Peter as our luncheon speaker today. And I'm just going to quote from one, uh, the introductory quote to his book by Isaac Asimov. So you don't, we don't have to label Peter with this quote. But it says, those people who think they know everything are a great annoyance to those of us who do. And frankly, I think Peter knows just about everything. So let's welcome Dr. Peter Singer. Thank you for that really kind introduction. It's, it's an honor to join you all here and uh, just a pleasure to speak to this important topic at this moment in time. So um, I work at uh, Brookings, a think tank in D.C., and one of the issues that we explore in the 21st Century Defense Initiative is what's changing about defense today. Everything from the new actors that are out there, ranging from insurgent groups to private military corporations, to the new demands being placed on the military, how it's handling everything from counterinsurgency to earthquake response, to also some of the broader challenges in terms of new technologies that are entering it and the new domains in which we're fighting. Now, this issue of trying to wrestle with what's happening next is something that we have to be honest and say we don't do a very good job at it. My favorite story of this is actually from the history of aerospace. And um, on October 9th, 1903, the New York Times had an article that said, quote, the flying machine, which might really fly, might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians in from one to 10 million years from now. That very same day in October 1903, these two brothers started to assemble a flying machine in that bicycle shop there in Dayton, Ohio. Now, rather than throwing our hands up in the air and saying, you know what, we can't do this. We just can't predict the future. There's, there's no effort at even trying this. I would argue that, um, we can't predict specific events with any kind of confidence, but we can identify key changes that are happening. That is, none of us should know exactly what that future world is going to be, what it's going to look like, but I think we can identify some of the forces out there that might shape that future world. Now, I think of a metaphor for illustrating this. Take a um, kettle that's sitting on a stove and it's full of water. Now, with all of our advanced science today, we can build an atomic bomb, but we can't predict exactly where a single molecule of water will be next. We just can't do it. But if we look at that system, we can say, okay, if I apply enough heat to that water, ultimately that water molecule is going to turn into steam. So we can look at that system and say a key force in this is heat. That's a key trend that's shaping things out there. That doesn't mean we know definitively what's going to happen. We don't know, for example, that, say, some little toddler is going to come along and knock that tea kettle over. You may have some kind of exogenous event. But in looking at the system, you can say heat is a key trend that matters, and we should pay attention to it if we want to peer into the future. Trends, they're guides, nothing more, nothing less. But these kind of macro guides are important to listen to. As John Naisbitt once said, trends, like horses, are easier to ride in the direction that they're going. Okay, so what are the key trends that are going to shape the future of the battlefield that our army is going to be dealing with? Well, one of the most important ones are the finances that underscore the army of today and tomorrow, our national economy. And this is what the situation looks like. Um, <laughs> Essentially, America faces, in the words of everything from the various presidential candidates to the Secretary of State, Chairman of Joint Chiefs, you name it, we keep saying again and again that we have a national security crisis 
when it comes to our economic security situation. The U.S. debt right now stands at $6 trillion and growing. And you can see from the below chart, which may be even more important, how good a job we do at budgeting in terms of deficit or surplus. This is not a partisan issue. Look across that system from the 1960s to today, only five years have we been able to create a surplus. So not good trend lines there. The figure grows all the more alarming when you put it into context to our overall um, GDP. If we don't take action to rein it in, very soon we have a debt to GDP ratio that doesn't look like a superpowers, but looks like Greece's, or even worse. Now, there's a lot of different ways to think about $16 trillion and growing. I think about it this way. What could we buy if someone somewhere gave us a big check that had $16 trillion on it? America, here's a check to cover your current debt. What could you buy with it? Well, as you see here, we could buy 32 new deals or 16 Marshall plans if we got that check. That's how much the size of our debt is. We could pay the budget of all of NATO, the United States included in terms of its defense, for 16 years. We could pay the rent for every single American apartment renter for 48 years. Or we could pay the mortgage for every single American homeowner for the next 18 years. We're Americans, though. What would we really do if someone showed up and gave us a big check for $16 trillion to cover our entire national debt right now? We'd all go on vacation. <laughs> and we could do so. Every single American worker could go on vacation for 176 weeks, every one of us. Now, the good news of this story is that we're finally starting to pay attention to this problem. We've had a discussion about debt and deficit for a long time. We said, well, that's in the long run. That's for future generations to deal with. We're now in the long run. It's here. It's the inheritance that we are giving our kids. Bad news is how we're going about dealing with it right now, which is primarily through budget cuts so far. The debt ceiling deal cut approximately a half trillion dollars from the national security budget. Like it or not, and to be clear, I do not like it, that train has already left the station. There's no turning back on it. We can argue about it. It's already there. Looking forward, we face an interesting situation. The only thing that stands between another roughly half trillion dollars in mandatory cuts, sequestration, is a slim, slim thread that Congress will show maturity and an ability to compromise to have a last minute deal. Now, if you're looking forward, this is an interesting, um, you're relying on something that they haven't been able to pull off for the last several years. So in terms of contingency planning, and it's fascinating to compare what this situation that looms for us to we're depending on Congress to show maturity and ability to compromise. Very slender thread. But what's interesting is that even if we get that deal, it's not the way the media and the candidates so far have painted it. The situation is not either $500 billion in cuts or zero in cuts. The deal on the table on the super committee, which wasn't able to come to a compromise, but would be probably the centerpiece of any compromise in the lame duck session, somewhere between another 200 to 300 billion in cuts. So we're not talking about a scenario of either zero or 500. We're talking about a scenario of either 200 to 500. Important point I'm making here is put this in terms of the long term. Pull back on all of this, whether it happens next year or not. In the long term historic situation, the defense budget goes in these ups and downs after wars. And you can see the projections there all the way on the left that show the different um, areas we might reach out. This is actually not my chart. This is a U.S. Air Force chart. And we're headed down. What's notable is that we're not going to the bottom of the trough. We're actually, worst case scenario of sequestration takes us to that average. But the interesting thing is, of course, our historic memory. Most of the people in the Pentagon, most of the people in the media and the discourse are only looking at that last sort of growing up period. This is the broader history there. But again, put it into context. It's going to feel a lot more painful when you put it compared to that overall national economy, where the percentage of um, the defense budget relative to GDP has gone down and down and down. 
Now, there's a number of implications I think we can pull from this long-term trend, not just what's going to happen in the next budget year, but this long-term trend over probably the next 10 plus years. One of it is that um, I think we're going to see, when we talk about technology, a greater emphasis on figuring out how to upgrade old systems rather than buy completely new systems as it's been in the recent years. So I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Now, I don't mean a lot more of actually the B-52 bomber, but I mean a bomber that first flew in 1952 that's still being used today. But importantly, it's not longevity that's what matters that makes the story of the B-52 so notable. It's the way that we've revolutionized its role, its usages. So we have a bomber that back in 1952 was designed to fly higher and fly faster than Soviet interceptors to drop a nuclear bomb that's now being used to um, carry out close air support missions in Afghanistan. We revolutionized its use through technology. Another way of thinking about this, and this is where it may not be you know, so popular to say it, is I think we're going to see a lot less of this kind of stuff. I think we're going to see a lot less of incredibly exotic winner-take-all programs, particularly when it comes to ground combat vehicles. We're not going to see as many of the visions of future combat systems um, that we thought in the past, or even, I would argue, probably the um, ground combat system today. Instead, I think the budget for the next five years, it will be focused on the need for practical applications and the fusion of existing vehicles with new systems and new technologies. We're going to see more isolated investments to existing platforms rather than a complete replacement, again, not the winner-take-all approach that we've had in the past. I think we're also going to see a lot more focus on interoperability, and interoperability in both meanings of the term. One in terms of the um, IT function of it. Um, there's, uh, if any of you have spoken to officers out in Afghanistan, for example, one of their laments, one of their big complaints is that uh, if you sp particularly speak to senior leaders, on their desk, they'll have somewhere between four to six computers, each of those to talk with a different part of the coalition there. One for talking with U.S. military, one for talking with just trusted allies, one for NATO, one for ISAF, one for... Um, uh, non-classified. And what they want is not six desktop computers, but one Android that they can fit into their pocket. Thinking about interoperability that way. Another way I think we're going to look at interoperability is what this picture illustrates. This picture here. Is it a uh, the French um, Navy carrier Richelieu under construction? Or is it the British Navy's HMS Queen Elizabeth under construction? Or does it even matter where the idea that they both have is a ship that will be manned by one Navy and have planes from another fly off of it. Thinking about interoperability in a whole new way with our close allies beyond just, oh, we might buy some of the same gear. If the French and the British can get in this kind of coalition, we might look at the same in these tough budget times. And particularly, I think we're going to be looking at that on the ground side to get further out of our dimes and our pounds and our euros. Similarly, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Um, not, the, not the old men part, but the COTS part. The uh, greater use of civilian off-the-shelf technology. The lowered budgets, I think, are going to be a real issue in driving the Defense Department into more purchasing of the civilian off-the-shelf technology, particularly where it's advancing further um, in IT areas. The challenge, the technologic challenge, is going to be how do we incorporate all of this into secure battlefield networks. And you're seeing that kind of discourse right now where people are saying, I don't want my super sophisticated uh, um, military made Android. I want the one that I can use now, but how do I bring it across into this battlefield network? This isn't to say that technology doesn't matter. I think it's the second key trend that's going to shape this battlefield. But it's when we think about technology, we have to put it in terms of the pace of the technology, I think, is the biggest key. A lot of you are probably familiar with the concept of Moore's Law, that we've seen a doubling of microchip capacity, memory, computing power, et cetera, just about every 18 months to two years. Now, I can give a better illustration of Moore's Law, and it's this. That's the scientific version. This is the military version. When my father 
served in the Army, the entire U.S. Army had as much computing power as this card, one of those Hallmark greeting cards that opens up and plays a little song. That's how much computing power the entire U.S. Army had when he served in it. To me, that's his graphic illustration of the fast pace of technology. Now, the important thing here is project forward. That's what's happened in the last 40 years. What happens as we move forward? Well, if Moore's law holds true over the next 25 years, the way it's held true over the last 40 years, our microchips, our computers, our technologies will be a billion times more powerful than today. I don't mean billion in kind of the way we talk about in Washington, D.C. budgets, you know, a billion here, a billion there, doesn't matter. I mean, literally multiply it one and nine zeros behind it. Are we incorporating that into our strategic planning? But again, Moore's law is not a law of physics. It does not have to hold true. Let's say, for example, technology moves at a pace that's just one one thousandth as it has historically. Then lop off those last three zeros and we'll see advancement that's just a mere million times more powerful than today. Now, I was recently at DARPA, and one of the scientists there you know, pushed back, and he said, no, 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 I think it's going to be just 10,000 times in the next 20 years. Okay. The point that I'm making here is that we think of maybe it'll get a little bit better, somewhere between a billion and 10,000 times. Are we thinking about that? Now, this challenge of adjusting to massive technologic change actually isn't something new. The Army has gone through this previously. I think a good um, comparison to where we stand right now is the period around World War I at the turn of the last century. We had a series of technologies that had recently been science fiction that were then introduced into war. One was this. H.G. Wells wrote a short story, a fiction short story, about armored vehicles that he called land ironclads. Winston Churchill read that and said, that would be incredibly useful to deal with these trench lines in World War I, but we can't call them land ironclads because the Germans will be able to figure it out real quickly if they ever catch the documents. So we'll call them water tank carriers instead. That's where the tank comes from. And actually, this is a picture of a young George Patton, one of America's greatest horsemen who, fortunately enough, went into the Armor Corps. Another example was something that A.A. A. Milne first conceived. A.A. A. Milne, who's that? Winnie the, Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. He also was the first person to write about the use of, quote, military aeroplanes. And I showed this um, to my uh, Air Force friends to illustrate that, hey, at one point in time, West Point drew in people saying, you can become a flying cadet. That's why you should join the U.S. Army. Gives a good illustration of the impact of these new technologies. Another technology that was conceived of was something that H.G. Wells called the, quote, atomic bomb, which then influenced the people who went into the Manhattan Project. Now, I wrote a book about one of these killer apps, these killer applications, robotics, where in the last 10 years we've gone from having a handful of unmanned aerial systems, remotely piloted aircraft, drones, whatever you want to call them. We went from a handful when our forces went into Afghanistan, none of them armed, to more than 8,000 in the U.S. military inventory today. On the ground, our forces had zero unmanned ground vehicles when they went in. We now have well over 12,000 and growing. But importantly, these pack bots, these predators, they're the first generation. They're the equivalent of the Wright Brothers Flyer. They're the equivalent of the Model T Ford. We are in the horseless carriage stage of this. Even think about horseless carriage, unmanned systems. We can only wrap our heads around what they're not rather than what they are. And of course, moving forward, we're going to see ourselves go from not thousands of robotic systems as we have here, but as one three-star general put it to me, the next conflict will see us use, quote, tens of thousands. But we're going to see changes not just in the numbers, but the kind of systems that we use. That is, we'll see changes in their size, shape, or form. They're not going to look like the manned platforms that they're replacing. You, know, you look at a system, some of these aerial platforms, they look like manned planes, even down to having the cockpit painted over. We're going to push past that. Their size, their scale is going to diversify. Mimicking nature, you name it. The second huge change is something that we've never seen in war before. Their greater intelligence, their greater autonomy, where the weapon system will be making more of its own decisions. 
We've never talked about that. When we compare weapon systems previously, like the B-17 bomber and the B-24 bomber that the Army Air Corps flew back in World War II, we would say, well, the B-24 flies faster, flies further, carries more bombs. That's why it's better. We can say the same thing about the Reaper compared to the Predator. Flies faster, flies further, carries more bombs. That's why it's better. But the Reaper is also smarter. It can take off and land on its own, fly mission waypoints on its own, has sensors that can detect a milk jug from a mile overhead. The Reaper is not the Terminator. It's not making all of its own decisions on its own, but it certainly is smarter, more autonomous than the Predator. We've never had that kind of weapons comparison before. And finally, we're going to see the user base and functionality of these systems grow, where they're going to be doing not just ISR surveillance roles, not just strike roles, but we're seeing them take on roles that range from cargo delivery to medical roles to you name it, sentry duty. Um, essentially, we will see a crossover much like how the airplane went from just being observation to taking on a whole new suite of roles. And an important thing to keep our eye on from the military perspective is just like what happened in computers, the civilian side is going to be where a lot of the excitement and energy is. In 2015, in the next presidential term, the civilian airspace in the U.S. will open up. And a lot of people think that this will do to the robotics industry what the Internet did to desktop computers, create this huge new boom. And so we have an interesting thing happening where we may have more innovation happening in robotics on the civilian side than within the military. Just to give you a historic example, the first time someone used a plane for cargo delivery, which is now the centerpiece of our Air Mobility Command, it was actually civilians, and only then the military copied it. Same thing in long-range cargo, looks to be civilians is going to do it first before the U.S. military. Likes to do it for um, the plane is transatlantic cargo delivery. And of course, this is not just going to be an American phenomena. There are at least 50 other nations out there that are building, buying, and using military robotics today, including our friends in Iran there. Bottom line, robotics is coming, whether you like it or not. See, even the Terminator knows it. But what's next? That's just one technology. I'm working in a project, uh, and I see a couple of folks in the room are also part of it, called Next Tech. We're trying to figure out what are some of these other game-changing technologies that are out there. The idea of being equivalent to where the computer was in 1980, or where the Predator drone was in 1995. That is, they're real, but they haven't yet made their force felt on the world. So we, for example, did a survey of over 60 different scientists, futurists, investors, what do you think are these game changers? This is a word cloud of some of the things they thought were out there. Okay, what are ones that we think are notable? Artificial intelligence, but particularly the distribution of intelligence, where you don't just have AI winning on Jeopardy, already beating the best human champion, but you have it incorporated into everything from your sensors on the front end, so it's identifying targets for you and telling you about it, to doing data analytics on the back end. proliferation of this nasty thing. You'll go, oh, IEDs, those have been out there. The IED is actually a very old technology. We've you know, gone, this is really super tough. Well, it was used in our American Civil War. We go, oh, no, 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 the real tough one is the EFP. That's new. No, that was actually first used in World War II. The challenge moving forward is how does the IED evolve? How does it become smart? How does it become more mobile? And we've seen this happen, where everything IDs tied into robotics, to use in drones, you name it. To nanotechnology, shrinking in size and scale. Directed energy, lasers being used as a weapon. New manufacturing techniques, often called additive manufacturing or 3D printing. This is as big a game changer as the assembly line was. I'll give you a good illustration of this, this little system right there. A group of graduate students and professors in England decided, wouldn't it be cool if we could build our own drone? So they designed it in a computer, they manufactured it, and flew it in seven days. Compare that design to flight cycle to the F-35 by a group of basically graduate students. That's already happened. That's the space we're in here. We've also seen people make, for example, machine gun parts, et cetera. 
neuroscience breakthroughs, um, essentially uh, human enhancements. Um, I call this in fictional terms Iron Man and Captain America working hand in hand. But just as it was for the land ironclad, the key to success is not just getting this technology, it's your doctrine building, it's your experimentation, it's figuring out what's the best way to utilize it. So if there's an analog for all of this technology coming at us in terms of around World War I, it's a period in the 1920s and 30s where, for example, the Army went through, um, actually in 1940, the Louisiana Maneuvers, if you have a picture here, where they figured out the best way to incorporate mechanization in the force. And what did that mean for the officer corps? What kind of officers would thrive? What kind of officers would not? That was the sort of questions they were asking in the 30s and 40s. And of course, one of the other things that mattered was learning lessons by watching others. This is a picture of a Chinese anti-terror team. Now, I don't show you that picture because I think um, we should equip our forces with segues. I just think it's a really cool picture. But um, the point that I'm making here is if you go back to that mechanization story, the British were the ones who invented the tank. They had the most tanks. They actually did some incredible testing with tanks in the 1920s. They didn't incorporate it. The Germans, though, watched those tests, learned from those tests, and the Germans were the ones who got the blitzkrieg right. So we're going to have to not only incorporate our own testing, but also keep an eye out for what other people are doing and learn from them, which has not been something the U.S. military has had a great history of in the last um, generation or so, looking at others' lessons learned. This connects to a third trend, big change, where we fight. Now, when we do our strategic planning, we lay out the map and we go, where's that next big conflict? We say, maybe it's going to be North Korea, maybe it's going to be Iran, or let's be really um, projective and say, oh, what about Syria? There's something bigger happening, and I would argue it's going to happen right here. This is a picture from um, actually the Call of Duty video game series. The here, and it's a, a battle taking place supposedly in 2025 point that I'm making is that war is a human endeavor for all its technology. And war takes place where the people are. And for the last 10 years, we've had a focus on essentially um, how do we simultaneously navigate the complex geographic and social patterns of defeating a guerrilla army while winning tribal elders' trust in the midst of the most remote region in the world. That's been our focus in everything from the QDR to go read the new US Army Captain Training Manuals. Yet, what if the rest of the world is moving in a different direction from the villages we're focusing on that haven't changed fundamentally since Alexander the Great fought in those exact same villages? That is, what about this chart? What if humanity's future is urban and its past is rural. If you look back, the percentage of the world population that lived in an urban center around the 1800s was only 3%. A couple years ago, it crossed the 50% mark. Depending on whose projections you buy, over the next 20 years, it'll be in the 70 to 80% mark, the world's population moving into cities. But as we add 3 billion new souls to the planet, 99% of them in the developing world, it's not just a move to cities that's happening. It's not just a move to cities in the developing world that's happening. It's a move to mega cities that are happening. More than 40% already live in a city of 1 million or more. And we're seeing the evolution of 10 million plus cities. So if you go back um, to uh, around 1960, there were two mega cities on the entire planet, New York and Newark and Tokyo. As you see this map here, we're seeing a blossoming of them, and most of them in these tough regions of the world. And of course, over the next 20 years, we're going to see somewhere between 30 plus more megacities pop up on the map. More importantly, these cities are changing. The cities are not characterized by their glittering skyline, by the skyscrapers. They're characterized by this that surrounds them. We call it different things in different places. We call it slums. We call it favelas. We call it shanty towns. It's the miles upon miles of squatter communities where literally millions of the young, urban, poor are gathered. 
the angry losers of globalization are clustered. And so what we're seeing is not just a shift to the cities, but a reversal of what's happened in conflict and insurgency. Traditionally, insurgency, conflict, has started in the rural regions, and only if it was successful did it come to the city. In the 21st century, we're seeing the reversal of that trend. These broken cities are now their Sherwood Forest. They're their home turf. Whether you're talking about Mogadishu, Fallujah, Freetown, Gaza, Grozny, Sadr City, cities are not just where they're able to recruit, it's also where they do better than professional forces traditionally. Now it's important again to pull back and put this into historic context. Um, for a long time, the city was something that professional forces did their best to avoid. For example, Sun Tzu wrote, quote, the worst policy is to attack a city, only attack a city where there is no other alternative. And then go back and think about the great battles in history, whether you're talking about Agincourt or Gettysburg or um, 73 Easting, basically the professional forces would find a big open ground to meet and clash. This was woven into our doctrine. You know, go back and read Air Land Battle um, Plan in the 1980s. How did it deal with cities? It was basically avoid the cities, make this, maybe try and make the Soviets get stuck in them. But go back to those trends that I told you. We're not going to be able to avoid the cities. And it's not just about when we take on large professional forces or when we take on insurgent groups. It's also all the other things that the Army might be asked to do, everything from peacekeeping to humanitarian disaster relief, you name it. And the challenge that faces us is that the city is perhaps the most complex environment to navigate because it's, the threat there is multi-directional and multi-dimensional. You can not only be attacked from 360 degrees, but also above and below. For example, the, the group that, that project I was talking about looking at battle plans in the 2025s period, one of the sort of novel technologies, the evolution of the IED, was a sewer bot IED. And again, it's not just your frontline forces that will face this threat, but as we've already seen in Iraq, for example, it's all of what used to be your rear. They're all under threat in this space. And if that wasn't challenging enough, you have the mix of civilians into this battle space. So for example, another book that I did was looking at the rise of warlord and child soldier groups out there. One out of every 10 combatants in the world today is a child. A threat, but a threat professional forces don't want to face. So the bottom line that I'm making here is the open field advantage that our army has sought and achieved is risked by this block by block threat. Now there's huge implications of this for technology and industry. Um, I would argue that investment in systems that are big and not survivable in urban settings is wasteful and they're likely the ones that won't make it through the system. So um, I'll knock on, for example, that one up top, the expeditionary fighting vehicle, which the Marines were very um, excited about, but fortunately got canceled, I would argue. Not just because of its size, it's the size of a city bus, and you go, oh, city bus, you talked about city. No, a western city bus. Imagine it going down these alleyways and like, wouldn't fit, but also not survivable in that environment, able to be destroyed by any 14-year-old with an RPG or an IED. Or we have, for example, how we're thinking about IEDs, that bottom left picture there. We're putting a lot of investment into trying to stand off detect IEDs. One of the new technologies people are excited by is something that allows us, instead of finding an IED by that traditional way of the metal detector overhead, is that it can pick it up from over 100 feet away. A great improvement for our forces in Afghanistan. Perfect for that dirt road. Move forward, though, and hand a soldier a system that says the way you're going to find an ID is by finding a piece of metal from 100 feet and it goes into an urban setting. That system is going to be the first thing they literally throw away. Two other technologies like um, the concept of the flying Humvee, uh, able to be taken down by anyone from an IED on the ground to um, someone with a power line. Instead what I would argue, oh sorry, one other thing just to give you a, a good illustration of this shift that's happening. This is not just about insurgency. You know, maybe we'll talk about links to, oh, um, air-sea battle doctrine and the like. Well, 